Okay, let's pick up with a new topic, uh, which is social categorization. And the reason we're doing this is because, as Bruner pointed out, every act of perception is an act of categorization. You haven't completed the process of perceiving an object until you've identified it and then matched it up to other things that you know about. That is, categorize it in terms of this object is the same as other things I know about and different from these other things. So what we want to know, if we want to continue our discussion of how social perception happens, we need to know something about how categorization happens as well. Okay, so first let's do a little vocabulary here. Um, we think about uh, people's concepts, fundamental concepts, as part of their repertoire of semantic knowledge, abstract, context-free knowledge about the world, as opposed to their episodic knowledge about specific events that occurred at a particular time and a particular place. So let's just look at what, what else we have in semantic memory. We've got object knowledge, so whatever objects you encounter in the world, if you know what they are, you identify them, you know what they're good for. Um, uh, that's semantic memory. Linguistic knowledge, knowledge about the meanings of words and all of that. Uh, and then finally, categorical knowledge that underlies our ability to um, assign objects to subsets and supersets, uh, to make judgments of similarity, and also to infer from knowledge of categorization what attributes an object may have. So if I say to you, mm, I'm going to show you to my car, you know what kind of object you're going to look at. You're going to look at something that's more or less metal, uh, that's got four wheels and a driver's uh, uh, the compartment and all of that. You can infer what attributes an object has just by knowing what category it belongs to. Yes? Well, you certainly haven't finished receiving it. That's right, because you haven't identified it, you haven't categorized it. You've glanced at it. Okay? But from this cognitive point of view, yeah, you've detected something in motion in your environment, but you don't know what it is, you don't know where it is, you don't know what it's doing. The act of perception isn't finished yet. That would be the point of view adopted uh, here. Okay. Um, uh, the, uh, in the social domain, um, social categorization has to do with the developing of uh, equivalence classes in the service of social interaction. So once we've categorized somebody as one kind of person or another, once we've categorized some situation as one kind of situation or another, once we've categorized some action as some kind of action or another, then we know what to do. We have some idea about how we're going to behave towards that person in this situation in response uh, to, that, uh, to that behavior. And again, uh, in most models of categorization, not all, we'll talk about this a little bit later on Wednesday, um, categorization is based, on, is, uh, is based on similarity of objects. I see two things as similar, I assign them to the, uh, to the same category. Um, in cognitive psychology, this, we, uh, we make a distinction which we then go on and violate every day, a distinction between categories and concepts. Technically, categories exist in the real world. Okay? They, are, uh, they are observer independent somehow. And what every category does is to take the objects in the real world and partition them into some sort of equivalence classes so that these are more or less the same and different uh, from, uh, from these objects. We also distinguish between two kinds of categories, natural categories and artificial categories. Natural categories are the things we find in the natural world, naturally. Um, artificial categories are often used in psychological experiments devised by fiendish experimenters to try to unpack what the process of categorization um, is, uh, is like. Um, uh, and then there are concepts. Concepts are mental representations of categories. They're the ideas about categories that we carry around uh, in, our, uh, in our heads. But as I said, we violate this distinction all the time. Most psychologists use the term concept and category interchangeably. Okay? But there is a technical distinction, and it's important for at least cognitive psychologists to understand this. Because again, it's not, the, it's not the, the object in the real world that determines our behavior. It's our mental representation of it. It's not the category in the real world that determines our behavior. It's our mental representation of it. And so we've got these natural categories, which exist independently of the, of the observer somehow. We've got these artificial categories, which are products of individual minds. And one of the questions we want to ask is whether and to what extent the the categories that we encounter in the social world are natural categories that exist independently of the mind and are discovered by the mind, or are the ca uh, categories we encounter in the social world uh, a product of human intelligence and not just discovered by the mind, but actually created uh, by the mind? Put another way, are social categories natural or artificial? And as you'll see, today I'm going to take you on a quick tour through uh, uh, the social categories. You'll see that this is not always an entirely easy question uh, to, uh, to answer. Okay, so categories, concepts anyway, uh, mental representation of categories, um, is usually labeled linguistically by some kind of word, and we have special uh, kinds of, uh, of labels for these categories. Categories of persons are generally labeled by nouns. We call somebody a preppy or a jock or a wonk or a nerd or an extrovert. Those are all nouns that refer to classes of people. Um, we have uh, categories of social groups, whether those social groups are represented by social stereotypes, something I'll talk about next week, or even psychiatric diagnoses. If I say he's a schizophrenic or he's a depressive, that's a categorization of that person. Situations are also uh, labeled linguistically uh, by, by nouns, uh, parties, funerals, weddings, whatever. Actions, however, are generally labeled by adjectives, and a particular kind of adjective known as a trait adjective, where we'll label some behavior as an extroverted behavior or as a, uh, a conscientious behavior or whatever. The whole vocabulary of personality traits really consists of a set of conceptual labels by which we categorize various kinds of, uh, of, of behaviors. And then finally, we have categories of social interactions, um, a sequence, whole sequences of behavior that are often uh, labeled in terms of scripts. I won't have time to talk about scripts, I don't think, uh, in this set of lectures, but there's a big discussion of scripts in the, uh, in the lecture supplements for those of you who are interested. So now, having uh, laid these foundations, let's look at the kinds of uh, categories and concepts that we encounter in social interaction and that we use in social, uh, social cognition. Uh, skip that. Okay, the basic social category, uh, the category, the basic act of social categorization is a division of the social world into us and them, people like us and everybody else. This is uh, one of the oldest topics in sociology. This is a quote from uh, a guy named Sumner, who was an early sociologist. In fact, he taught the first course labeled sociology. The insiders in a we group are in a relation of peace, order, law, government, and industry to each other. They all like each other. Their relationship to all outsiders or other groups is one of war and plunder. Well, that might be a little too extreme, but the general idea behind uh, the Sumner's uh, the distinction here is one of the distinction between an in-group, the group to which one oneself belongs, and an out-group, um, the, uh, the um, group to which other people who are not like oneself uh, in some way belong. Again, notice this basic categorization, this basic division of the world into us versus them, in-group versus out-group, is based on some kind of, uh, of judgment of similarity. Um, early uh, experiment in social psychology uh, offered a nice demonstration of this. Those of you who have taken a social psychology course almost certainly have heard about this experiment. This is a famous Robert's Cave experiment of uh, Elizabeth Sheriff and his, uh, and his colleague. Uh, a bunch of uh, fifth graders sitting, uh, uh, living in the state of Oklahoma. 
Oklahoma were taken to a summer camp at Robbers Cave State Park. It's a lovely state park in Oklahoma. Um, if you ever are passing through Oklahoma, make a pilgrimage. Um, and the experiment uh, consisted of a couple of uh, the, the phases. In the first uh, the case, uh, the, the, uh, these children, these fifth graders, fifth grade boys, uh, were uh, divided into two groups and allowed to name themselves. One group named themselves the Eagles, and the other named themselves the Rattlers. And um, uh, for, the, for the first stage of the experiment, these two groups, the Eagles and the Rattlers, were in, allowed to engage in various kinds of activities for that group only, independent of the other group, uh, intended to uh, watch, uh, allow the investigators to watch the building up of natural cohesion among group members, the establishment of some kind of status hierarchy, who's a leader, who's a follower, uh, and so on. In stage two of the experiment, um, the two groups, the Eagles and the Rattlers, were engaged in a set of games in which one group was pitted against the other group, various kinds of, uh, various kinds of tournaments. And what the, uh, what the observers uh, observed right at that point was the development of something that hadn't occurred before, a tremendous amount of intergroup hostility. The Eagles would say mean things about the Rattlers, the Rattlers would play mean tricks on the Eagles, and so on. And also there were shifts in group leadership so that uh, the leaders began to emerge who would foment and lead this kind of intergroup uh, hostility. So again, what you've got is this division of so of these kids into us versus uh, versus them. Uh, here's a nice example of this, uh, the sign that these kids constructed, you know, um, uh, and uh, Eagles, you may win, but we will give you a hell of a fight, right? Uh, these are five-year-olds, uh, these are fifth graders, right? At one point, there was a little game uh, called 35 Bean Pickup, in which the investigators threw a whole bunch of beans, honest to God, beans, uh, out on the grass and engaged the Eagles and the Rattlers in a, con in a contest to see who could pick up the most beans. And it turned out the Eagles uh, thought that they had picked up the most beans, okay? And the Rattlers thought that they had picked up the most beans. It was a really nice, uh, quick demonstration of this kind of in-group favoritism uh, that's, a, that's a characteristic of this distinction between us, uh, us versus them. And then in the third stage of the experiment, put these things back together again. Um, uh, Sheriff and his, um, and his uh, uh, colleagues um, uh, tried to reduce the animosity between the groups by engaging them in all sorts of cooperative uh, behaviors, uh, putting them in non-competitive settings, putting them in places where teamwork only by, by virtue of cooperation between the two groups could some, uh, some overarching goal get accomplished, and they saw a reduction in group hostility. Uh, so that's basically what the Robbers Cave experiment was all about. And again, it's just an illustration of, um, of uh, this in-group, out-group uh, dynamic. Now, in the Robbers Cave experiment, we, uh, we had people who were kids who were assigned to one group or the other by, uh, by adults. Someday I'll get this fixed. Actually, let's do this. Um, OK, uh, here's another example of this. Oh, you can't do that. Sorry. There. This is good. This is actually a very good sign. There. Damn it. Why are you doing this to me? Okay, give me a minute here. Technology. Well, if I try to restart it, you know, I actually don't want to do that because I don't want to waste the time. But we'll do it. There we go. Okay. This led to the development, the, the experiments like the Robbers Cave experiment led to the development of an even more radical demonstration of the us versus them uh, dynamic, which is known as the minimal group paradigm initiated by Henri Tajfel, uh, in which people were actually arbitrarily assigned to one group or another based even on something as random as, random as a coin toss. So we have these two groups, uh, uh, people come brought together, randomly assigned to one group or another on the basis of some wholly dumb uh, uh, criterion. Uh, they don't know each other. There's no basis for the imposition of pre-existing in-group and out-group stereotypes or whatever. And then uh, all... Uh, the, uh, all Tashwell did was to create a situation where there was some kind of reward, a couple of dollars, and you want to distribute um, uh, these, these, these awards between individuals within and, uh, and between the groups. And what Tashwell discovered was that people were much more likely to distribute points to members of their own group than to members of an out-group, even though there was really no basis uh, for making that distinction. So it's called the minimal group paradigm. Here is uh, another example uh, where people were randomly assigned to groups based ostensibly on their preferences for paintings. Uh, did they like paintings by Paul Clay or Vasily Kandinsky? Um, Hard to know how to choose uh, there. Um, and then, so these people, you're a clay lover, right? You're a Kandinsky liker. Um, and then people were asked simply to uh, predict the attitudes and beliefs of other members of their own uh, and their uh, uh the other group. And the finding here was that this is different from the self. People thought that they were more like other people in their group and quite different from other people in, their, uh, in the out group, even though the assignment was made purely arbitrarily. Simply the division of people into us versus them, in group versus out group, uh, created this kind of problem. I don't know what I'm going to do with this. You know, I actually thought I had this fixed again, but I don't. Okay, so. In groups, out groups, us, them. That's the basic, so, uh, the, the basic categorization in the social world. But there are more, more interesting and more subtle uh, distinctions as well. Roger Brown uh, thought about this for a while and came up with a list of what he called the natural categories of persons. The natural categories uh, that exist in, uh, in the social world, ranging from categories based on sex and kinship to categories based on nationality, race, and ethnicity. Let's take a quick tour through these because what these categories are, not always quite as obvious as you might, uh, as you might think. Let's start first with gender categories, which seems to be the most obvious thing. There are two kinds of people in the world, uh, male and female. Uh, you can determine that by chromosomal sex if you want, or phenotypic sex, that is, the possession of secondary uh, the sex characteristics or, or or whatever. Um, but what you see here, I think, is, uh, is a really interesting intersection of categories between a natural category uh, that has to do with simply reproductive anatomy uh, and a more social category where being male or female carries an awful lot of extra, uh, extra meaning. So we start out by thinking there are two sexes, but it turns out that there might be more than two sexes. Uh, there are males and females. There are people who are genetically male but have uh, uh, phenotypically female reproductive anatomy, at least as far as the external genitalia are concerned. You have people who are genetically female but have uh, uh, phenotypically uh, male uh, external reproductive anatomy. Then you have a small group of people who actually might have both kinds of, uh, of gonadal tissue. And Fausto Sterling, who's a biologist at uh, Boston, uh, Boston College, has argued 
we don't just have two sexes, we in fact have five sexes. So there's a complication uh, in, uh, in social categorization. You have people who might be male but look female. You have people who might look like they're male but actually be, uh, be female. Here is another uh, variant on this. We have not just what sex you are, what gender you are, but what, how, how you identify your gender. We have people who are biologically male who identify themselves as female and vice versa. We have individuals who identify themselves as transgendered. Um, so there's an issue of gender identity, how you think of yourself. And then we have issues of gender role, whether you're conventionally masculine or feminine, uh, as, uh, as defined by the culture uh, you're in. Some people uh, classify as androgynous, uh, in that they seem to have both highly masculine and highly feminine characteristics. And then there's a group of people who just don't seem to be very masculine or feminine at all, call them uh, undifferentiated. And we also have, uh, beyond mere gender identity, uh, issues of sexual, uh, the sexual orientation or, or erotic orientation. Are you heterosexual? Are you homosexual? Are you bisexual? Are you asexual? There are lots and lots and lots of gender-based categories, all of which go beyond the simple natural category of male uh, versus uh, female. If you put them all together, if Fausto Sterling's right, and there are actually five biological sexes, five free gender identities, by four gender roles, by four sexual orientations, you end up with 240, not two, but 240 gender-related categories. It turns out that when we look at social categorization, not biological categorization, gender, uh, the gender becomes more complicated than just one or the other kind of uh, person. Uh, here's another one uh, within, uh, that Brown talked about, the kinship categories, that is, who your blood relatives are, are. We identify these basic categories in a nuclear family, parents, mothers, fathers, siblings, sisters, brothers, children, sons, and daughters. Those are naturally occurring uh, categories. But then we have the categories of what you might call the extended family. You've got uh, great-grandparents and cousins and third cousins once removed and uh, uh, nephews and all of these people, and they all belong to a particular category. When you introduce somebody, you say, oh, yes, this is my third cousin or whatever. Uh, you actually put them in a group uh, that makes them different from first cousins or second cousins or siblings or uh, whatever. So kinship categories are very, very, very um, uh, uh, diverse. There's a, there are an awful lot of them. Moreover, to make things even more interesting, kinship categories differ according to culture. Different cultures divide up the kinship world differently. Okay. So uh, Nurlov and Romney, two cultural anthropologists, argued that there were at least six major types of kinship categories. Uh, here's type A, where people only make a distinction between siblings. My brother or my sister, my sibling, or not my sibling. Then there are type B categories. This is like uh, Western culture. Make a distinction between brother and sister that type A cultures don't make. Now, obviously, they recognize the difference between brothers and sisters, but they don't make that classification uh, socially. Here, type C, uh, type C cultures distinguish only between the elder and the younger brothers of somebody, but don't make a similar distinction between elder and younger uh, the sisters. Type H uh, cultures make that distinction for both brothers and the sisters. Uh, type G uh, cultures are quite interesting. They make a distinction between siblings of the same sex and siblings of, the di of a different sex. They have the same name for, sibling of a, for the same-sex sibling of a woman, of a girl, as for the same-sex uh, sibling of a, uh, of a boy. So there's a distinction there that really has nothing to do with the, uh, that has to do with the relationship between the perceiver and the object. And then finally, there are these very complicated uh, type L cultures that have different words, different linguistic labels for same-sex brothers and sisters and for opposite-sex uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, uh, and for, for that matter, for elder sis uh, brothers and sisters versus younger brothers and sisters. Two by two by two, eight different sibling categories in those particular uh, cultures. Here's an example of uh, Hopi uh, in Indian, uh, sibling terminology, where the Hopi language distinguishes between an elder brother and elder sister, the younger sister of a male, a younger brother of a male, or the younger sibling of a female. So you've got five sibling categories in Hopi culture, uh, categories that don't necessarily have counterparts in other cultures. Hopi language has words for these. We can distinguish, because, oh, yeah, I know who that kind of younger sibling of a female uh, is, uh, but we don't have words for that. They do. It's a category for them that they use to divide up uh, their, social, uh, their social world. Okay, then we've got age categories. And again, some of these uh, turn out to be bio, uh, more or less biological uh, categories. We distinguish, be we distinguish between prenatal, uh, uh, age before birth, infancy, childhood, adolescence, young adulthood, middle age, um, uh, elderly, and all of that. They're more or less given by the age of the person. Um, although uh, there are these interesting distinctions here that parents use an awful lot to talk about kids. The terrible twos, right? You all went through that. If you don't remember it, ask your parents what you were like when you were two. Um, uh, then there are, we don't just have adolescents now. We have uh, preteens and uh, tweenies who are about 12 uh, years of age. Now with an aging population, we don't just have elderly people. We have what's known as the old, old, people who are uh, older who are over 80, who now appear in numbers that they didn't appear before. These are social categories that we use to carve up the world with respect to age. Yes? Gee, I don't know about that. That's a really good question about, but it's a really good question. I suspect it's true, or something very much like that is true, because the labels we give to people tell us how we're supposed to behave towards them. Okay? So if you make a distinction between your older sibling and your younger uh, sibling, there's probably a, a, some kind of status relationship uh, uh, there. Now, I, I just don't know enough cultural anthropology. Do I know any cultural anthropology? No, not besides this. Um, uh, so I, I just can't tell you. But it would be something to ask your local neighborhood cultural anthropologist. Uh, and uh, if nobody knows, that would be a really interesting thing to look at. You know? So that's a good question.